Let's give a warm welcome to our man, Mr. Bob Moo. Um, a couple of months ago, I found this quite recommendable book, um, which looks like this, somewhere in a really stupid bookstore, but still, like with records, it's always worth checking them out. Funnily enough, a little article in there by someone called Bob Moog, and it goes, Mini Moog, the ultimate in antique analog. And if there's any chance, would you like to read the first sentence to it? <laughs> you mean it? Yeah, I do. <laughs> I haven't seen this for a long time. Well, it says here, nearly a quarter of a century ago, uh, how long ago was that? Uh, I think it was first published in 93 and then redone in 2000. The, <clears throat> the Mini Moog first hit the streets. And it was at the beginning of the last decade that Moog music ceremoniously slapped brass plaques on the last 25 minis off the assembly line and sent them out to fetch inflated prices. Did I write this? Well, that was what I was wondering about. <laughs> Yet the instrument's d distinctive sound is very much with us today. In fact, uh, in particular, it's fat, Three oscillator bass sound has transcended novelty and fashion and become a timbral staple, joining a small number of instruments, the Hammond B3 organ and the Rhodes electronic p electric piano are two that come to mind in the Keyboard Hall of Fame. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I don't remember writing it, but uh, it's, it, it's more or less right. It's, yeah. <laughs> Some people might do one or two great things in their lives, but I mean, making an, a synthesizer is not what you dream of when you're a little kid. How did you get there? I mean, how did you, your fascination with all these weird words like oscillator and modulation and ooh, freaky stuff start? When I was a kid, I, I got off on electronics, especially electronics that made a sound. Now, when I say electronics, it's not like the electronics of today. Uh, electronics was one or two vacuum tubes and a couple of resistors and a couple of capacitors and these big fat transformers. And you could put the whole thing together uh, on the kitchen table. It was a hobby. Uh, it was, it, uh, you know, some kids were out playing baseball. Nearly everybody else was out beating each other up. Uh, I, I couldn't do either, but I, I really liked electronics. And my father was uh, an amateur radio operator. And back then, uh, he was one of the very first amateur radio operators. So he remembers days when vacuum tubes were powered from batteries. And uh, what I was doing seemed very avant-garde and modern to him, but that's, you know, in the same way that what you do today, it seems natural to you because uh, you've grown up with computers now and uh, digital stuff. Uh, the, the, the electronics I grew up with seem natural to me, and I've been at it ever since. How yeah. do you go from playing around with transistors on the kitchen table to building a pheromone? Back then, where the World Trade Center was, even before where the World Trade Center was, uh, there was a section of downtown Manhattan where you could go, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a mart for electronic parts. There's such a thing today in Tokyo. It's called Yakihabara. You know, you go, and there's little stalls, uh, one after the other, and you can buy resistors and tubes and, you know, microprocessors and so on. Uh, but and that's uh, like a food market. You go like, oh, I'll have five of the green transistors. Yeah, and three yeah, of the yeah, yeah. Just hobby, yeah. I went to Bronx High School of Science in, in New York City. Yeah. Uh, there, there we go. Uh, it, was, it was a very good school. It still is. Uh, you can learn a lot about science. And what's even better is they don't beat you up for being a nerd. <laughs> So uh, you know, I went there, then I went to engineering school, and I, I loved it. I loved engineering school. So what did you learn there that you incorporated in sound design, or how would, did the sound and music thing come back in there again? 
Well, I learned the basics in school, but the whole business of sound design, uh, I was sort of in the middle of as, as that became, you know, uh, an important part of, of music. Uh, I was right there with the people who were doing it, and I was helping them do it. Who were these people? Uh, I think we can begin in 1964, it's almost 40 years ago, and I, I met a com an experimental composer. Now back then, uh, being an experimental composer meant that you had a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder and a razor blade and splicing tape. That's how you began. And then anything else you could get to make, to record little segments of, of sounds, either with a microphone or with electronic stuff, was extra. But for sure you had to have this tape recorder. So uh, the first person I worked with, Herb Deutsch, uh, who, who was a, a music teacher at Hofstra University in, in uh, Long Island uh, was, you know, he had a vision of, of making music with his tape recorder. It was very experimental. There was no such thing as an audience for this. Uh, you know, maybe there were a hundred people in all of New York City who knew what electronic music was. I, I met Herb at a uh, music teacher's conference and it turns out he used uh, one, uh, a theremin that I had built uh, in his classes. He taught uh, ear training, and sight singing uh, with a the theremin. Then he asked me, did I know anything about electronic music? And I thought to myself, well, it's electronic. I, I know electronics. It's my hobby. And it's music. I took music lessons. So I said to him, yes. I know about electronic music. Oh, I didn't know about electronic music. I had no idea. So I learned very quickly from Herb. And, uh, you know, as uh, when we first met, a couple times after that, he asked me, uh, you know, could I help him make some new sounds? Well, I asked him, what, what did he have in mind? And he, he made the, you know, some mouth sounds, you know, like beep -oo, beep -oo, beep -oo, or wee -oo, wee -oo, wee -oo, like sounds like that. And that was, that was the beginning. I, I thought about that. I knew about transistors, which were just new then. I, I knew about some of the technical properties they had. And, and don't ask me where the idea came from to make what's called a voltage-controlled oscillator or a voltage-controlled amplifier. Uh, but I just thought about it, and in the same way as, as many of you think about putting a tune together or a mix of some sort, uh, the idea came. We're in right in the crimp part already. What the hell is a VCO then? So here's uh, let's see. Yeah, we all know that feeling. We don't seem to be cooking here. Mixer, there's a signal out. Ah. Okay, so there's a low tone. That's, uh, I can look over and see the, uh, the speaker going in and out. So it's vibrating. It's vibrating in response to uh, an electrical voltage that's going up and down. So it's an oscillator. Uh, as I go up the keyboard, the oscillator goes faster and faster. That's, That's an octave above the highest note on the piano. So, um, that's an oscillator. Uh, 
Now, what is a voltage-controlled oscillator? Well, back in 1964, uh, if you were an, uh, an engineer or a technician, you wanted an oscillator, he, you, you got out your test equipment catalog and you, you saw the, you know, a picture of this big box with a knob on the front. You set the knob to the frequency you wanted. Uh, and if you wanted to change the frequency, you turn that knob to a different frequency. Uh, that, that's really good if you're an engineer and you want to you want one frequency and you want it exact. It's not good for a musician because music is all about changes in sound, including changes in frequency. So it's kind of hard to play a big knob like that accurately. So instead of having a knob on this oscillator, uh, there's a place to plug in uh, a something to control the sound with that I can manipulate with my hands. Let's go down here. Okay, so that's a pitch glide. The way that's done is uh, the keyboard is, is changing an electrical voltage from low to high, in fact, from high to low. And I've uh, turned a knob, knob up here that is called glide rate. It's, it's slowing down uh, the, the steps that I would normally get playing the keyboard. And this is the sort of thing that musicians and us uh, uh, instrument designers learned on the job during the 60s. Nobody had this understanding before because before voltage controlled oscillators, it wasn't possible to do what I, I just did. How close was the relationship between musicians and people who were experimenting with the stuff and you engineers in coming up with new concepts? Uh, back then, uh, most of us knew enough about music to, you know, to be able to talk with musicians. A few of us were actually musicians. Uh, one person who did a lot of work right around the time I began was Don Buchla. And, you know, Buchla's still doing fantastic designs, but he's a musician as well as an engineer. And more than that, uh, you know, more than me, uh, Buchla has his own musical vision. I, I don't have a real musical vision other than helping other musicians to do their thing. So when you talk about us, who is this us? It sounds like a pretty exclusive club there. Well, it was pretty small. Uh, <clears throat> I, I worked, uh, th there were a couple of engineers who w once I began, you know, uh, came around and, uh, and eventually joined the company. Uh, people like uh, Jim Scott and Bill Hemseth. The, these are not names that are extremely well known, but uh, if you happen to be into Moog lore, you will have heard their name. Uh, there was a, an Italian television engineer by the name of Paolo Kedoff. Uh, and uh, he designed an instrument called the Sinquet in the early 60s. He worked with a lot of musicians. Uh, I think he and I were similar in, in that we were, we were both engineers, but we liked working with musicians. Ironically enough, what they called the military industrial complex yeah. wasn't too bad for the development of for a lot of musical instruments as well. What? No, 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 during the Second World War, the whole field of electronics advanced incredibly. Uh, int interestingly enough, uh, the tape recorder was invented in Germany and was, was used uh, uh, in Germany during the Second World War. And uh, uh, I think the manufacturer at that time was called Magnetophone. And uh, a couple of uh, American soldiers, uh, officers, brought back one of the Magnetophones uh, and uh, they happened to be an engineer 
engineers who, who worked uh, for a company in California called Ampex. They manufactured motors. So they brought back this strange contraption that had motors in it. They figured, well, you know, maybe Ampex could uh, find some, you know, something to use their motors for in this new invention, the tape recorder. And uh, that, 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 that's basically how tape recorders got started in the United States. What were the favorite albums where you would go, that's a Moog sound, and <laughs> I'm proud that I contrib contributed to it? Gosh, there were so many back then. Uh, and they were all interesting. Uh, <laughs> well, switch, uh, switched on Bach and, and Carlos's records that came after that were uh, seminal, I, th I think is the right word. Th th they showed what could be done that nobody understood before. You know, they, that started something. The conventional wisdom in the music business in, in the late 60s was that you could make stuff like this, uh, you, could, you could have it make funny sounds, uh, ear-catching effects that, that could be put into radio commercials and, uh, you know, experimental music, but you couldn't make real music out of it. And of course, we all know, you know what real music is? I was just about to ask that. Anybody know what real music is? Well, uh, People in, the 19, you know, people in the music business knew what real music was. Real music was music that made real money. <laughs> so uh, Carlos's record made real money, and then people understood, yeah, you could really use these things to, you know, to, uh, to produce, to play, to uh, realize whatever word you want to use. You know, music that wasn't wasn't important because it was novel, because it was the first time, but because people really wanted to listen to it. It satisfied some need. It, it you know, it, it 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 was the music itself was valuable to people, and Switch on Bach is still being sold today. Uh, it, it was the largest selling classical record of all time for a long long period there, uh, and. After that, you know, thousands of musicians around the world understood, yes, you know, this, this seems to be something that I too uh, could make music, make my music out of. How quickly did the word spread then? Uh, well, uh, when Emerson, Lake and Palmer began touring, the word spread pretty fast, but still, uh, th this is our point of view now, our, our perspective. Here we were, uh, a small company manufacturing these things. Uh, they were not cheap because there's a lot of stuff inside. But nothing was cheap back then. Everything was analog. And it was taken for granted that uh, if, if you wanted a good sounding keyboard instrument, you'd have to spend over $1,000 which was a lot of money back then. The first time we showed at a trade show, speaking of a trade show, it was at the Music Merchants Convention in Chicago in 1971. And I can remember uh, you know, being at that show, and the, the music retailers would come by, and they'd look at it with you know, this long face like that. And they'd, Look at it and say, what's that? <laughs> so it's a synthesizer. What to do? <laughs> well, then you show up all this knob, you know, and this knob here and this knob, you know. He went, went through a little. And then, uh, you know, usually they said something like that. You expect me to sell that in my store? You expect musicians to understand that? And they walk away panel there. Yeah. Or probably before we go into, I mean, when you look at, when you, we go back to the ARP yeah. and look at the ARP or Model D for that matter, yeah. or this thing here, um, something strikes you instantly. 
um, it's the texture of the thing. The texture? Yeah, and the fa uh, I mean the material oh. used, yeah, the yeah. wood, and, yeah. and why designing something which was supposed to sound so sci-fi and so future with some really retro wood, earthy? Uh, I never had an idea of how this was supposed to sound. Uh, it, was, it was never anybody's goal to have it sound like something that was already in existence. And every musician I worked with had, had a different musical vision, different, you know, worked in a different area of music. So uh, what we did uh, musically here was to keep things as general as possible. Uh, th th this is not, you know, it's not designed to make a specific sort, any specific sort of sound. Uh, as to, you know, why the, there's a, a nice wood cover here and a uh, you know, nice wood case and wheels that light up, nice big fat wheels that light up blue, it just feels good. Uh, it, you know, it's musicians more than the average person need things that feel good. You know, making music is, is even if even if you use a, you know, one of those little G fours I see all over the place. Even if you use that, it has to feel good. Your G four feels better than my PC, I, and uh, and that's important to you musicians. And in the same sense, uh, we've, we've tried to get the front panel here and the keyboard and, you know, what happens when you turn those so they feel good to musicians too. You can begin almost any place. Uh, one feature of, of, of the Voyager, Voyager, by the way, has been on the market for about a year now, a uh, little bit more. Uh, it, it, uh, it can do everything that the original Model D can do, and quite a bit more. One of the most important features uh, is that the entire front panel can be, pre uh, can be stored in a digital memory and, and recalled instantly. So what you can do is you can bring up a sound. What? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> That's Ileana there. She uh, <laughs> she keeps me uh, focused. <laughs> uh, you can you can call up a sound and then you know change one knob after the other. Some of the knobs for a given sound, some of the knobs aren't going to do anything because they're not part of that sound, but other other knobs will change and and you'll begin to pick up. Uh, it, you know, if that's how your mind works, if, you're a Keith, if you have a Keith Emerson mind and you learn by turning knobs, then that's, you know, that's how you pick up here. On the other hand, if you have a more analytical mind and like to envision a structure, the underlying structure, uh, then you can re read the manual. You'll understand that the sound begins with the oscillators. So uh, there are three oscillators. Uh, and each section of the panel here is, is one of the oscillators. See, it says oscillators on top, and then one, two, and three. So here's one oscillator. So I can select the, the pitch range, uh, and I can select the waveform. What is a waveform to start with? Waveform uh, is. If you, if you had an oscilloscope that showed you the shape of the vibration and time, that's what the waveform is. You can't, you can't look at How a waveform. How come that, is, that explanation is so short and they teach you all this stuff in school and you never understand it anyway? I mean, that, that was pretty brief. Well, it, yeah, but it, it doesn't help musicians much at all. In fact, it doesn't... You know, unless you're worrying about how the circuit's working, which you shouldn't worry about at all, uh, the, the particular, the, the, exactly what these names of, of the waveform means aren't any, aren't important. But uh, each waveform has a spectrum of harmonics associated with it, and you hear that, 
So it has a quality, and as, as I change the waveform, you hear the quality change. So there, there's little drawings here of the waveforms. Uh, one is called triangular, one is called sawtooth, because it looks like the teeth of a saw. Another one's called square wave, another one's called rectangular wave. And, uh, and I can go continuously from one to the other, which, by the way, you couldn't do on the original mini mode. Okay, so there's, there's one oscillator, here's two oscillators. And I can uh, set the interval between them. All musicians know what an interval is. And here's three oscillators. Now if I, uh, I don't know exactly what interval I just set up. Uh, uh, that's a major triad. I can, I can tune these to uh, any th uh, three note chord I want, including unison. You know, just make them all the same. Now, one oscillator, two oscillators, hear the difference? One, two, three. If we had an oscilloscope and we were looking at the waveform, we'd see that the waveform is constantly changing because these three, these three waves are beating with each other uh, very, very slowly. That's, that's a technical waveform-oriented uh, description. For musicians, it's, it means it's a fat sound. That's fat, and this is thin. Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, I just talked about eight knobs here. Three waveforms, three octave clickers, and two uh, frequency knobs. Let's call them interval instead, you know, musical interval. And that's, uh, that's the, our basic oscillators. Uh, there are ways of interconnecting these, uh, which I, I don't know if we'll have time to do it or not, but you know, let me go on and t take care of the, the other sections here. So uh, another section is called the mixer. We have three oscillators, we have to mix them, so here's. I can have a mix where one is stronger than the other, or all three are the same, and, and I, I can change it as, as I play if I want. Uh, in addition, there's a, another source of sound. It's not a pitch sound, it's called noise. And in, in combination with the filter, uh, that can uh, create effects that you can't do with oscillators. The fifth one is called external. There's a jack on the back where you can plug any sound source at all, your guitar, your turntable, you know, the output of a mixer, the, the, the uh, theremin, you know, anything at all, and shape it with the rest of the stuff on here. So, here's our, here's our mixing. So hang on, hang on. Uh, I can plug whatever I got in there, whatever signal, and can still yeah. fuck around with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you sure you want to take this home then? then? N no, uh, no, uh, you know, I'm not. We need the dog, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure I want to take this home. <laughs> Why? You... No, well, later. Uh, no, no. I can make an offer you can't refuse. Uh, well, I have to speak to Michael beforehand, you know. <laughs> okay. Now, this, this, this section right here is called filter. Uh, if there's one electronic operation that's, a, that's associated with analog synthesizers in general, 
and the Moog synthesizer in particular, it's this filter. Okay, so here's, here's uh, what happens when I turn the knob of the filter. What it does is uh, cut off the, the higher harmonics uh, first, then the, the, the lower ones and lower ones, and finally you're left with just the fundamental pitch, which is right here. That's uh, sort of now a uh, sine wavy. This filter, like the oscillators, is, is voltage controlled. Uh, so, for instance, uh, if I wanted to, uh, there we go. I'm using a slow vibration to, to open and close the filter instead of doing it with my hand. Um, LFO is a thing most of us heard through, off, through a project by the same name. Um, we were wondering, <laughs> we just knew it was LFO, speaker LFO, rattling. LFO, but LFO, LFO, LFO. Low frequency oscillator. <laughs> so you did your rave A level, so I can see that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, uh, play a nice fat sound like this. Just being able to change the harmonics that way. Uh, sort of heightens the, the fatness of the sound. And it, it, it more particularly, it, it, it gives you something to be expressive with, you know, to give the sound motion that's just at the right rate and, and the right amount to, uh, to enhance the music. This, uh, this filter here has another control. It happens to be called resonance. Uh, in the, in the case of a filter, what that does is it emphasizes uh, a particular pitch that the filter is uh, filtering and gives the filtering a sense of, of uh, its own sense of pitch. So let's t turn that off. Here it is without resonance. Here it is with resonance. We have actually two filters here. Now you'll hear two resonances. If you listen closely, you'll hear that one is coming from one speaker and one from the others. So the, out the output is stereo. And what I'm doing with these knobs here is ch changing the, uh, the shape of the filtering and moving the sound around. And these are, the, the, these are player controls. These are not something you set to an exact number and leave alone. You play these things, you put your hands on, hold the key down, put your hands on one of them, hear the effect, and then you know if you're Keith Emerson. And the, even if you're not, even if you have, even if you're used to listening to things, you, uh, you, you pick up what, what the individual knobs are doing. I, and, uh, I guess <clears throat> all the fancy stuff in the middle, that would help me store these things or, yeah. I mean, what is this, all this here? Ah, this is a touch surface. This is one way of moving the sound around that's different from a knob. Uh, 
it is a control device that uh, y you can use the, the you know the, the sound storage and recall part here the, the digital part you can uh, you can use the digital part to route that to control a lot of different things so being the devil's advocate with yeah. um, a new G5 power book something less than three months away from us why would I still need a machine which is about five times bigger than that and probably eight times as heavy yeah uh, how to answer that question. For some of you, uh, your G5 uh, is, you know, is going to be exactly what you need. Uh, for, for, for other of you, perhaps, it's, you, you'll find it very easily to, easy to connect with this, very musically satisfying to produce music on this. Uh, this whole thing is conceived you know, with all these knobs and the spacing of everything and, and the fact that the switches are nice big fat rocker switches here. Uh, you know, it's designed to be played live. Uh, well, interestingly enough, <laughs> yesterday when you came down from the Steinsky and Seiji thing, yeah. um, you were going on about how they gave away valuable information and I think the thing which struck you the most was this thing about not being enslaved to technology and its That's means. Right. Yeah. I mean, so they cut off your whole, well, you're, you're living everyday life. Uh, no, that's not right. Uh, musical instruments have always, from the very beginning of human history, have always used the most advanced technology of the time. Musicians need advanced technology. That's uh, that that that's appropriate. Whether you uh, you know wh whether you need a particular advanced technology uh, is uh, you know is, is partially wh what kind of music you want to make and how you want to make it. Uh, the the string our stringed instruments were developed two three four hundred years ago when woodworking, you know, precision woodworking uh, was, the, was the highest technology. Brass instruments uh, were developed uh, when there was really high quality brass and, and the ability to machine, you know, to, to create a very thin, uh, accurate uh, materials out of brass. The piano uh, came into existence uh, along with manufacturing technology. The piano is pr probably, uh, for most of us, uh, the piano is likely to be the most high-tech mechanical manufactured product that we'll ever have in our home. Uh, in the 20th century, no, no brass instruments or wood instruments or mechanically Mechanical instruments have developed, been developed in the, 10th, in the 20th century because in the 20th century, the technology of our time is electronics. First, it's analog electronics, uh, and now in, you know, increasingly computer and, and digital electronics. <coughs> so the, so this, uh, you know, this is an instrument of the 20th century. It, it doesn't use the very most advanced, but it definitely uses uh, a technology that came into existence during my lifetime, for instance. Uh, what do I want to say? Uh, How do you separate in a whole analog, digital, okay. myth, folklore, yeah. reality debate? We all, you know, we all have uh, tools that are particularly comfortable to us, whether you know we're musicians or engineers or whatever. And for this combination of sound producing capability and, and controls, uh, you'll find that uh, just you know th things are natural. You, you find it easy to connect with the instrument. There's no doubt about it. it, it you know, sure, you can you can do a lot of things with your G5s and your G4s, uh, a lot of different functions, 
the sound quality though, you know, just the sound that I just made, that there is a difference between a analog and digital. Part of the difference can be explained in technical terms, uh, having to do with, uh, you know, a, a, a digital waveform is updated 44,000 times a second, or 48,000, or 96,000, or 192,000, uh, you know, but it's still, it's, it's up to updated in steps, whereas there's, no, there's nothing stepped at all about this sound. Everything that makes the sound here, or that shapes the sound, is analog. It's completely smooth. Uh, so, so is this, yeah. is, if I get you right, digital would be like going to Legoland and seeing like the Legoland version of a house or of an animal and it yeah, would be yeah. no matter how many small bricks you would use still be yeah. little bricks not the yeah yeah that's the idea and I'm, I'm searching for for a way that's not going to sound too too strange to, to say this when you connect with an instrument, whether it's a guitar or violin or, or a set of drums or an electronic instrument, there is an interaction that is, is outside of, of what's actually going through your finger. There, there, is, a, there is a connection that I, I hesitate to use the word spiritual but it, uh, it, it has to do with the forces uh, that we know we, we living things uh, can exert and can respond to. And I'm 100% I'm sure that th things like this, even though they're not living in the biological sense, they are... Th uh, there is, in some sense, Ileana knows a lot more about this than I do, that there is, in some sense, a consciousness that we connect with. I, I, I've known a lots of people, and I'm sure you've known a lots of people, who touch every tool they, uh, you know, they break every tool they touch. I, you know, I, 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 I've had people working, you know, with me who, uh, you sit, you sit him down on a computer and 10 minutes later it's not working. <laughs> you know, there are people like this. And I know, I know for a fact firsthand that I'm the opposite. That I, I, can, I can make an instrument, if I really want to, I can make something work uh, that looks like it's not going to work. And you, you, you develop that sort of a, of a connection with, with an instrument. And you know, some of you uh, will develop that sort of connection with your G4s and G5s. Others of you may find it possible with an instrument like this, or with a cork trident, or you know, any of the other great stuff that's out there. So, what's it like being a circuitry shaman of sorts? It feels good, you know. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, it's you know, what I do is is very satisfying to me. And, and part of it is because I, I, I it, you know, it, it's not something that's out here beyond my fingers. It's, I know it's, uh, I know I'm connecting with it. Even as, even as a designer, even though I'm not using it to make music, I'm, I'm connecting with it. As a musical instrument designer, what sort of stuff is happening these days that intrigues you in terms of new devices and new trends and where the, the design of new instruments, is, new electronic instruments is going. Are there any? We're at a point now where, at least in the digital realm, any sound is possible. What's interesting is new, new control devices for manipulating that. You know, even, uh, even an Ovation controller your computer, it connects in through MIDI, uh, is, is really an interesting, it, it's at least as interesting as the software inside the computer that makes the sound. You know, making stuff in the studio is, is really great. 
that, you know, there's just no end of, of stuff uh, that you can put on a CD now, walk around and listen to. Uh, this is something fairly new in human history. Up until, say, 100 years ago, or even less, uh, music was something we did together. You know, it was a community activity. Uh, the only music that there was was live performance. And, uh, you know, and it was for the benefit of, of groups of people who interacted with each other. Uh, I, I'd like to see that aspect of music flourish in the future. I, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, I, I'm not knocking recorded music, but I'm saying, you know, uh, if, if listening to music is, is going to be an increasingly lonely uh, activity, you know, that we do with ourselves and to ourselves, uh, then we're going to miss something very important about being human. You know, the ability to get together and do something as a community in real time. <laughs>